Writer's Block, Season 4 of the Telly Award-winning podcast, coming at you like Dominic Toretto, cutting the sleeves off our button-down shirts, cracking open some ice-cold Coronas with the family, and living our lives a quarter mile at a time. I am Rylan Grant, screenwriter, Ringo Award-winning creator of fine comics like Aberrant, Ben Jackson, Napa, Shang Ordens, the other west in the dark, the man on the box to the left is... David Avalone, writer of things, and I am among the slow and the furious. Oh, wow. Still furious, though. That's Still good. furious. I, yeah. the, fury, the fury is there. I just take my time with it. Hold on to that fury. Let it, let it, uh, let, let it fuel you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I've uh, never seen a single one of those movies. Oh, well, you should, man. They're, they're, they're a, a ride. I know they're very much your, yeah. like, to me, they seem like the 80s action movies. Like, someone yeah. is still making Rambo movies, yeah. uh, you know, unaccountably, and yet there they well, are. There, there is a tipping point. We shouldn't get, uh, we shouldn't get too far into this because, uh, I'm still in the middle of the intro, but also we have a very important guest, uh, uh, in the green room. However, there is a tipping point where, um, uh, you know, I mean, now they've become superhero movies and they're completely yeah. absurd and they're entertaining, uh, uh, you know, in their own way. Um, it really hits, they, they hit their peak around, uh, Fast Five is, is the best movie. I have heard that. You know? Yeah, I've I I heard, yeah. uh, heard that uh, yeah. semiotic analysis of the Fast and the yeah. Furious movies before. Yeah, and they start out as car culture movies with a heist element, and right. the 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 interesting tipping point is uh, Fast Five is a heist movie with a car culture element, and it really kind of it really solidifies there. Um, but that becomes the biggest movie in like Universal summer history, basically. Right. And then and then it becomes a matter of hey man. We just need to get the next one into production. And right. so with six, Justin Lin is basically shooting an outline and it's just, it's, it's set pieces taped together. Um, sure. uh, burns Justin out completely that so much so that he leaves the series. Seven ends up being a little more coherent because un unfortunately, God rest the soul, Paul Walker dies in the middle of production. And so they have to shut down that shoot, shoot, shoot machine and they have to be like, we don't have Paul anymore. How do we make something? How do we make something that makes sense? And they had to do so much work on the story and on that that seven is seven's pretty damn good. Also, <laughs> also it has this 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 incredible thing at the end where they say goodbye to Paul. The Wiz Khalifa song comes on that that makes me cry every time. Uh, anyway, I, I I digress. I digress. I digress. If you have missed any of our previous digressions. Uh, digressions and episodes featuring comic luminaries like David F. Walker, Matt Fraction, Stan Sakai, Kevin Eastman, Rodney Barnes, and a couple of episodes with today's guests. Uh, you should double on back and check that out. Our entire catalog can be celebrated via YouTube, uh, iTunes, and other purveyors of worthwhile ear crack. Uh, so get on it. Um, but great show today. You got anything you want to cover before we bring our, our, uh, our very patient uh... guest in? This will be premiering the same day that Elvira in Monsterland Part the Second drops, which nice. is called Frankie Goes to Hollywood. It is the Frankenstein issue. Yeah. It is uh, Karloff Tastic, as it was, as you would, and yeah. uh, I think it would be enjoyable for all friends of fans of Universal Horror. And uh, I will be at San Diego Comic Con apparently since my badge has arrived. And oh, wow. uh, and it's you will have when this drops you will have mere two days left to get your Elvira and Avalone comics in the mail to send to CGC for the big uh, the slabbing. If you want your Avalone oh. comics in encased in carbonite, signed by me and the Mistress of the Dark, uh, running out of time. So yeah, get, yeah. get over to that CGC website, uh, find out what you need to do, and get on it. Sign me the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> um i got stuff coming it's gonna be grand watch uh you know watch the twitter feed and all that stuff uh but let's get richard in i'm i'm uh, i'm excited to talk to do him. let's richard Fairgray, ladies and gentlemen hello and i i want to be honest i did actually have my sleeves rolled up to do a fast and the furious thing but then rylan talked about it for so long that i just had yeah. to let them back down yeah yeah it was too I, it was getting, getting too but cold. you weren't hardcore enough to cut them off yeah no, I'm not because this is uh, this is one of my very few shirts that I genuinely like the way it feels. Nice. It's not even about the picture. I just like this fabric. I will say, Ryland, I think the tipping point is the Universal Studios uh, ride portion of the tour. Oh, interesting. Experience yeah. Fast and the Furious firsthand and be part of the family. 
Yeah, well, the, the the new ride is pretty awesome. I mean, I, I, I the you're talking about the video ride that they have now. Yeah, is that what you're talking about? The, yeah, the, yeah. The, the very, On the very tram. stupid part where you're you're in the yeah. fucking you're you're going for a chase in the in the tram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because that's actually that, that is the second Fast and the Furious ride they had because they used to have. Yeah, I don't know how many times you've been to Universal Studios, but back in the day they had the they had like a backdraft ride that was really cool, lots of fire. And then at mm-hmm. some point they turned that into maybe like a Transformers ride, but mm-hmm. then it became a Fast and the Furious ride uh, in that same building for a spell, and that was pretty cool. But the new one is like I I, I, I was stunned. I had never experienced anything like it. It's like in 3D, and there's like wind machines, and you're getting wet, and like it was it was pretty cool. I don't I know. Mean, I mean, the other part of the the other part of the Universal yeah. Fast and the Furious ride is that your car is stolen in the parking lot uh, <laughs> while you're yeah. while while you're enjoying the ride. Yeah. No, I, mean, I love com- the, the evolution. completely absurd, but awesome. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. the the evolution in which the Miami Vice ride becomes the Water World ride. Yeah, is one of my favorite. That kind of thing at Universal Studios is my yeah. absolute favorite. And I was it could complete uh, to 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 continue the ridiculous uh, diversions. But the 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 commercial for the Water World ride. I used to be obsessed with the commercial for the Water World ride on TV because it looked great. And I yeah. always imagined Sid Sheinberg, who was still running the company at the time, walking in on Monday morning after seeing the commercial and saying. So we could have shot Waterworld in North Hollywood. Mm. <laughs> I spent three hundred million dollars on a city in the middle of the worst hurricane zone on Earth, and totally it fair. sunk twice. And we could have shot it out the window, yeah. like we could have got a second unit to get shots of the ocean and the close-ups of uh, Dennis Hopper and uh, Kevin Costner. We could have done here in 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 Century in. Uh, Studio yeah. City. Fantastic, guys. Great work. But Great thinking all around from everybody. Story. The story, David. <laughs> anyway, our guest today, Richard Fairgray, amazing cartoonist, artist and writer, uh, has a new book coming up called Four Color Heroes. I have my copy here because I'm special and fancy. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, you, you got yours before I got mine. That's how fancy you are. Yes. I am super fancy. Uh, I attended the publisher's birthday party. I think that may be that, that may be one of the reasons I got, yep. I got one. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> all that to say, uh, uh, it seems like a good place to start. You know, you publish a lot of stuff. You put out an amazing amount of high quality material. Uh, truly epic, you know, uh, uh, amount of material that uh, manages to maintain an incredibly high quality. Uh, what was the origin of this with Fanbase Press? How did that come together? Yeah. We, we should say uh, recently Eisner, Eisner nominated uh, publisher Fanbase Press. That's but, correct. Uh, but, but go ahead. Yes. But let's be very clear that that Eisner nomination is not for me. <laughs> not, yet. Yeah, not, not, until, yet. not until next year. Yeah. Exactly. Next year. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I had had this story for uh, well over a decade. Like I, um, I came up with the idea and... The original plan was to, uh, I would do the real life stuff and then all the superhero parts would be done by other artists. Um, and it was, <clears throat> I was in my mid twenties and it was just kind of a nightmare to, to organize. And it, I just kept thinking like, I'm not good enough to make this book yet. And then, uh, when COVID hit, I had two ongoing series, three ongoing series. Uh, one got canceled because of COVID and then two got kind of, not officially delayed, but like, I could just, I could sense the vibe that these things were going to, I was going to have a lot of free time. And I thought like, I have been in the bookstore market for a long time. I've never really cracked into the, the the comic market in the U S. Um, I need to find a publisher who can like, maybe not get me into like comic stores as such, but like, get me that kind of, uh, the the kind of publicity that you can that, that is possible when you're not doing a book about punching, um, and so I reached out to a handful of different publishers with a handful of different titles and just just said, I'm going to be making these anyway. If anyone would like them for free, and all they have to do is publish them and like get them out there because I'm trapped in Canada right now. And uh, three different publishers said yes to different things. Unfortunately, no one no one disagreed as to who should get what. 
And so then I ended up, um, two of those books are now, well, well Fanbase Press has Four Color Heroes, um, Blue Fox Comics has Shed, and then one other one, which actually still hasn't been announced three years later, so my theory is it isn't happening. Um, and it's been it's been pretty wonderful. And they, they were really good. They said to me that I could, I'd been doing Haunted Hill at the time, and I, um, I knew they liked that, but it was like far too raunchy for them to publish. And they said, just if you want to do this in like the style of Haunted Hill, that's totally fine. We like it's a good style. It's cartoony, but just do digital coloring instead. And I was like, great. It'll take two, two and a half months to make this book. And I got, I think, 12 pages in and I looked at it and I was like, this style just doesn't suit the book. It just feels um, like disingenuous to the tone. And so I started from scratch and I did the most detailed and like highly researched art I've ever done in my life. The book is set in New Zealand in 2004 and I didn't want it to feel alienating. So the story is not really about that, but I wanted to make sure like every single environment was as accurate as it could be so that people looked at it and felt like viscerally connected to a time and place. Um, and it ended up being nine months of 20 hour days. And I finished the book, uh, I think like October last year, I finished the art and then December or I don't know, like, yeah, December 30th, I finished the coloring on it, uh, cause 170 pages. And that was, that was super fun. Mm. I wanted to, uh, I, I realized when you said about the, you know, possibly different art, artists for the superhero thing, that we should tell people the premise okay. <clears throat> so that they understand that, that it's two teenage boys in New Zealand in 2004, as you said, uh, from extremely different backgrounds, <clears throat> excuse me, and sorry about the recycling truck outside, <laughs> uh, bonding over their, uh, over comic books. Uh, yeah, yeah, and particularly over a Superman-like comic book called yeah. Tekalos. Did I it's pronounce Telecos. it? Telecos. 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 Sorry, means I... the last. Um, it's in. Uh, sorry, which means the last in uh, in Greek. In Greek, okay, um, yeah, because he has the Alpha and Omega on his uh, on yeah. his uniform as well. Um, the, and... the idea was that like. Uh, the, the initial idea that I had 10 years ago, which, when it wasn't going to be set in New Zealand, and when I was actually still living in New Zealand, is simply like, these two boys fall in love through comic books, one of them isn't allowed to read them, the other one sees a loophole and says, I can describe them to you. So throughout the story, as their lives pull them apart, they have this monthly ritual where they come back together, talk about the new issue of Telecos, and we never see the real comics, just how the boy from the religious background imagines them. And the reason I wanted to have so, like a bunch of different artists was that it was going to be the first time he would imagine it as very cartoony and very naive and simple. And it would kind of graduate across the course of the book to being like a, as close to a real modern comic as possible. And I think like what, what I realized when I started making this, cause I, I kind of held on to that all the way until I started. And then I realized that if I did that, it was going to become a book that was, vaguely metatextual that was about a, a complicated political situation that was about really the emotional journey of these two boys and that also was now going to have 13 different styles of art in it instead of just two and so i scrapped that entirely and i was like the superhero stuff will be drawn entirely by me it will be a different style than the rest of the book but it will like and like the things that he will realize about it will or the things that he will grow to understand will be about the level of detail and the comic conventions of it all um, mm -hmm. rather than just like, rather than going from like Scott McCloud style cartooning to Bill Sienkiewicz style. Yeah. Collage. I, mm -hmm. I actually totally get that when we did the rag dolls, <clears throat> uh, the, the comic within the comic of drawing blood, I originally had the idea that every time he saw the rag dolls, it would be a different incarnation of them. Mm -hmm. That the meaner they were to him, the more they would be the Michael Bay a hideous CGI turtles, and when they were kind, they would be the very a very manga looking version of the characters and all that. And it just it it pollutes the visual language so much, yeah. And it makes the it foreground style over storytelling really, yeah. Uh, and I think that yeah. works. I will say it, it, it becomes noise if you make a few yeah. very specific 
choices um yeah. you know then but 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 yeah yeah too, well, yeah too, too many ingredients too many ingredients it right? also like yeah. it's 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 lazy because it works from the assumption that like a certain type of visual style a certain type of comic art style is incapable of conveying an emotion like great point you can actually just design mm. the characters well enough in any style <laughs> that they can show all their feelings yeah. um you don't have to switch to something else to make it better yeah no, also, Michael Bay's Ninja Turtles, uh, unappreciated masterpiece. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I should say before we get too far away from that, is as a guy who's you know spent a few hours in Michael Bay's uh, uh, compound, you know his his office space. Um, he has uh, six foot life size statues oh, of yeah. uh, of all four of those turtles uh, in in the office space. There, uh, you 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 go that you rules. go that yeah you, rules. you come right out of the men's room and they're right there. I mean, That's, it's like, you know, yeah. I did not know that. And yep. the first time the character based on him is introduced in Drawing Blood, there yeah. is a six foot Otomo ragdoll statue in the lobby. Yeah. of his Yeah. Well, yeah well, it's, it's funny. Not, it's funny. It's not surprising. It, it, yeah. The office is set up so you can actually go into the bathroom without noticing them. But then you come out and it's like, you know, it, it's Terrifying. like, you've ever had like a, I, I used to have like a, uh, you know, somebody, you know, way back when got me like uh, one of those cardboard Picard. Uh, you bought it uh, yourself. You can s standees. <laughs> no, no, no. But it, it would be like, you know, it would be stuck in the house somewhere. It'd be like in a back room or something like that. And you forget about it. Right. Um, and then you'd walk into that room for something and it looks like there's a fucking six foot man just standing in the room. It, it, and it was always that like. I, I knew that the turtles were there, but I would forget about them. I would go into the bathroom and not notice them. I would come out of the bathroom, and then there are these four six foot turtles there, and it's like, whoa! Yes, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, we had, we had the the a huge poster of the cover of the Killing Joke directly opposite the the the, the door to my bathroom uh, for years, uh, wow. and just just so that when you open the door, there would be a man with a camera. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Nice. You've been photographed coming out of the bathroom. So uh, you know, one, one very uh, comic booky aside, are you familiar with Kyle Baker, Richard? No. He's a really great. Well. He's a really great American cartoonist. Uh, and until this book, I w I hadn't connected his style to your style. Uh, but he's crazy talented, and he also can do a very cartoony. Uh, he's a, he's definitely ca capable of a very cartoony style, but he also is occasionally he'll do a cover for a superhero book, and his drawings of superheroes reminded me of your of uh, of Telecos. Uh, I'll I'll send you some examples because I think you'd really love his work. Um, without uh, you know, it's it's far too late for you to be uh, influenced by him. But I think you work similar sides of the street. He does uh, he's done everything from they had him draw Plastic Man for twenty issues, and it's one of the funniest oh, comics I've ever. That's why. Right, that's why. Yeah, uh, I discovered him because he did a graphic novel in the eighties called uh, Why I Hate Saturn, uh, which is one of those things. I think that's been developed as a movie or a sitcom like 30 times without ever being successful mm -hmm. uh and it's uh, just a just a really amazing thing but i i think you i think you'd enjoy his work but it, like but occasionally like he did one of the covers of superman versus the clan and it's just superman flying and it's a great superhero era illustration and it's also still like intrinsically a kyle baker illustration mm -hmm. like it and that's the thing I felt looking at your superhero pages is like these are perfectly good superhero pages that would not in any way alienate a superhero comic book reading audience while also being intrinsically Richard Fairgray, mm. you know. And I think that's a that's a that a lot of people can't do that. <laughs> you know, mm. A lot of people can't do the you know uh, the the something that would be. They have a style that is so much what they're their own, you know. Uh, no one wants to see Robert Crumb drawing Batman. Well, I want to see Robert Crumb drawing. Yeah, Batman I mean that would be kind of just, just for how much it would upset Batman fans. But uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't need him to make the money. But uh, but you know what I'm I'm saying? It's yeah. uh, you know it's it's great that this thing, this book, it has the look and feel of the. And I mean serious in a in the best possible way uh, mm. 
of a serious comic memoir type thing uh, while also being just very much comics, being yeah. very comics forward uh, and, and being, and being about the medium. I mean, I sort of wanted to talk about that. Where did the, where did this idea come from for you originally? I know that that's like a tough question always. And it's sort of a question amateurs ask people like, how did you get this idea? Well, the idea fairy, you've met well, him. No, like, here's uh, the thing. This is, this is one of those things that like, I can remember the exact moment that the entire story hit me at once. Um, I was working with a, a, a writer who I don't work with anymore because he's a bad person. Um, and he had, he had literally like left the room to go and make a cup of tea. And, um, there was a lot of, it was like, like, it was at that point when the Westboro Baptist church were like very in the headlines all of the time. Um, and someone had written something like about, uh, about like the, the way, like the, the way they like, uh, viewed media and things. And there was that, there was that amazing interview with, um, some of the kids from the church where they like, ask, it's like someone's like, so you, you, you hate homosexuals. And they're like, Oh yeah, yeah. We hate homosexuals. And they said, well, what's, and, and what is a homosexual? And um, the kids look really confused for a minute. And then one of them just like goes, I think it's like a Jew. And it's just like this perfect encapsulation of like, no. Oh, hate, hate doesn't need information. No, <laughs> like, no, exactly. I, 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 I had um, I had been thinking like is there you know like I'm always thinking is there a way that I can put uh, more gay content into into stories without it like without it being a story about being gay um, which I, I I think you know some people can do well I can't do well um, I, I'm very bad at being gay um, <laughs> but like the, the whole thing just kind of suddenly hit me at once I was like oh how would I tell someone about the, this thing that I love? Like, like a lot of the time when you're, when you're helping someone get away from hatred, the key is to show them something that, you know, they want to see and like giving them that way in. Um, and right. it was like, Oh, I, I can't give them a comic book to read, but I can tell them about a comic book and then leave them with that because comics get into our blood. Like we, we hear about them and then we don't stop thinking about them and then we start buying them and then it, it grows and grows. But like, it's that it's that initial thing of like, I don't want to pick up a book and be surprised. I want someone to tell me you're going to love this moment in this book when this thing happens, because then I will read the rest of the book excitedly waiting for that. Moment. Right. And well, you know, you, there's a there's a there's a dot I'd like to connect there as well, which is. One of the places that religious intolerance comes from and indeed could only come from is it's from people who won't read the book, but who will have what's in the book explained to them. Those yeah. kids that, that you're talking about didn't know what a homosexual was yeah. because the person who explained to them that Jesus hates homosexuals yeah. uh, was telling them it's in the book and it's very much not in the book. Mm. So the religious fanatic, the religious follower is already used to people reading a book for them and telling them what's yeah. awesome about it but in that case, they're lying. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, hate never survives reason or experience. That's mm. that's that's the bottom line. I mean, once you once you actually experience uh, something, it, it 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 disarms all of that shit. It's it's hate is hate is taught, and and then you know, and then reason has to be kind of deprived of its oxygen. And the moment mm. that oxygen comes back. Then yeah, but the, 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 the hate can't survive is, the is the bottom line. So, so, so yeah, of course you didn't read the book. If you read the book, it'll change your mind, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, no, and the danger we're in now is the people who, you know, you show them the fact and the reason and the logic and they still go, well, that's not, you know, you're lying. You're lying. You quote them scripture. Yeah. You literally I, quote them scripture and they go, well, no, that's not in there. It's like, no, it, it, it is though. I mean, yeah. It, right it, there. It, it, yeah, I mean that, that that yeah, I mean that's about, you know, it's committing to ignorance. I mean they're yeah. they're refusing to actually experience what yeah. you're talking about. No, I mean putting something in front of somebody is different than somebody actually, okay, yeah. I'm going to no, it, I, I, it, I'm gonna give this a shot, right? I mean it's like yeah. the you know, there was a great uh there was a great study done in England once. There was some anti immigrant thing on the ballot and they discovered that the people who voted for the anti immigrant thing 
lived in small hamlets made comprised entirely of white English people. And the people who were pro-immigration lived in London, Glasgow, like lived in places where there were a lot of immigrants and had experience of them and were therefore were not afraid of them, did not hate mm. them, didn't, you know, because, and that's the thing, you know, it, it, it's an aside, but like when, especially like right after 9-11, the people you would encounter who were the most terrified that the Muslim terrorists were going to get them lived in a small town in Kansas in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And I would say, you know what, buddy, you are safe. Mm, yeah. Al Qaeda is not coming to Laredo. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, you're in, you're in a, you no, <laughs> no Muslim terrorists, no fanatic, no, no foreigners are invading your town, four hundred miles in any direction from any border, <laughs> nowhere near industry, nowhere near culture, politics, anything. Yeah, when it comes to Laredo, feels like the title of a like prestige television series individual yeah. episode that would yeah. be up for an Emmy. Yeah. I, I'm I'm selling it to Netflix later this afternoon <laughs> uh, yeah. so that I can be uh, abused uh, by a major corporation. But uh, but yeah, one of the other things that I thought was really striking about the book, uh, you know, one of the boys is Maori, right, mm -hmm. and the other one is a a white lad, mm -hmm. and. I think the boring, you know, writing so often is like, well, what's the boring way someone would do this to someone who doesn't know New Zealand and doesn't know the culture. Mm -hmm. The obvious way to do that story is that the white kid is the religious bigot. Yeah. Like that is the, I was, even I was surprised. I was like, oh, right. They're, you know, the Maori kid has been raised in this r religious indoctrination. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, I thought that was a very interesting way to do it because that, you know, that is a thing. Well, it's, it's, it's a huge, um, part of like the, 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 in the initial version, obviously, like I was, I was, when I had the idea, I thought I will do this about Westboro Baptist and I'll kind of like file down the serial numbers. And then it was like, oh, but everything they do is so extreme and goofy and anything I write about it is going to feel like really on the nose satire uh, and it was just going to feel tired. And so then when I realized like, oh, this kind of bigotry is everywhere and it's far more insidious when it's quiet. Um, and I, like, I know what the New Zealand version of this looks like. There's a, there's one church right. in New Zealand who like have been actually in the headlines a lot recently because of like anti-vax stuff and everything. Um, shockingly. But um, they are, uh, it's like, New Zealand is a small enough country that was colonized relatively recently, like, you know, less than 200 years ago. Um, and all of the bad that goes with that. Um, but a, a big part of the bad that goes with that is that like uh, religion is used as a, like you know, a, a tool of colonizers to, to oppress people with rules. Um, and so a lot of like, especially this one, particular big church that I'm loosely basing this on loosely basing this on because they're litigious um, is like, has a very heavy, like Maori and Pacific Island uh, congregation because they're not in uh, the bigger cities as much like they're present there, but they're, they're far more present in the, in the towns around New Zealand and their actual like big headquarters is in um, a place called Rotorua, which is a like touristy uh, kind of hub that is like also a real town that has this weird mix of like you can go to Rotorua for like the 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 luge and the zip line and the hedge maze and you can also go there for like really genuine culture and uh, also get in a big inflatable ball and roll down a hill. Um, <laughs> it's it's, it's a it's a wild place uh, and it's also where like all these natural hot springs are so people like flock to it to be like I want to be in a smelly town that's great. Um. And so, yeah, it like it. It really just made sense for this to be. If I'm setting this in the only city, the only big city in New Zealand, which is Auckland, there are other cities, but they're just not. They're you know population wise, they're very small um, compared to U.S. places. Uh, I'm trying to like not shit on New Zealand as I say this, but I'm just like, look, people <laughs> from there know it. Like, I lived there 30 years. I know what it's like. Um, it 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 made sense that like they could be a part of this church. <laughs> without being uh, at the headquarters of the church. They wouldn't be right. there for the, like, 
the big scary like let's all get together and do but they're still the, just the look we live in the real world but we're part of this thing and it affects every decision we make and this kid has been homeschooled until now right. and now he's had, like because the mother believed that the church was going to open the school that, 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 that they had said they were going to open and right. when they eventually didn't do it she had no choice but to send her kid to a regular high school and this is like in a in a in a more bombastic story that would have been terrifying for her and she would have found a way out of it instead this is just a mother who is making do and so she has to do it and it's like all these like there are these little moments where you can get into someone's life and help them to not be not to grow up to be a hateful monster and and like just this like n the number of coincidences that had to happen for these two boys to even meet um and yeah, like it, it was it was just finding all those little pieces and New Zealand was the place to to set that for that to be possible. Well, and it's also, you know, it's it's a drum I beat a lot of, you know, part of what part of being a writer is writing what only you could write. Mm -hmm. uh, and this definitely feels like a story only Richard Fairgrave could write in comics at this time in the, you know, in the year uh, 2023, like, you know, the combination of elements is so specific to your background and experience. Mm. Uh, and that's a good thing. I mean, I always think that's the, it's when people try to write generically about circumstances, they don't really understand that you get yeah. very, very bad writing. It's when, uh, when you're, you're viewing a culture from a, from a telescope. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also it's like I, I mean, there is. I think there's a significant, you know, portion of the, you know, quote unquote, enlightened population. I mean, people that would really dig this book, but if they, if they're like, oh, it's Westboro, I don't know if I want to spend any time there. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It almost makes you take a step back, where it's like, where instead you're taking us into this world that we don't fully understand. It's new to us. It's right. very interesting. Yeah. Uh, we're, 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 we're coming, we're coming at it with like a blank slate. And then we sort of realize that, oh, oh, this is what this is. This is interesting. This is, you know, there, there wasn't that initial sort of bias going into it. I think. That's and also important. you, I mean, you could do a bunch of research and write something great about Westboro, but mm -hmm. this is, but a lot of other people might write that story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No one but you is going to write the story, this story set in this location with these characters. Yeah. And I think once you realize that, you go like, no, this is this is for me. This is the thing for me to do. It's mm -hmm. I was meeting with an old I had dinner with an old friend of mine, uh, sort of a legendary stand up comic. And we, we got into a conversation about uh, this actually is relevant, I promise, about Mrs. Maisel and uh she lasted through the whole series with, while not liking it. I couldn't get past three episodes. And part of it was uh, I had just been doing a series myself, a comic series set in the 50s. And watching the first couple of episodes, I was like, there are three things I understand very, very well in this world. The world of stand-up comedy, New York City. Well, now I'm going to go with four things. New York City, Jews, and Jewish American culture, as one myself. Uh... And was I where where did I leave off? Stand up comedy, Jews, New York, and the period. Mm -hmm. And in two episodes, I went, This is a person who does not understand even one of those four things, mm -hmm. has not spent enough time in New York, is not Jewish and does not understand you. Or if she's Jewish, God bless her, she doesn't understand the culture and she condescends to it and is presenting the same exact cliches about Jewish life that everybody has put in every movie since the beginning <clears> of time. <throat> She thinks that stand-up comedy works this way. It didn't then. It doesn't now. Uh, and I know I know great stand-ups that worked on the show worked in the writer's room. Either they weren't listened to or they, they smoothed everything out for an audience that they thought wouldn't get the real thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, it was refreshing to hear my friend say, oh, yeah, no, everything, everything about that character's life and career is science fiction. Mm. Uh, and uh, and that's the, that's what happens. It's like maybe you should write a show about a TV writer who becomes successful writing about two white chicks in New England in the 1990s. That might be a thing. Uh, that is a story Amy, Amy Sherman Palladino is uniquely qualified to tell. Yeah, yeah I know. But uh, then they're going to end up with like that. That is justification for every comic memoir about why someone writes comics. It's justification for every show about a show. And I, I, I don't want that either. 
No, I, yeah. I agree. And I, you know, I don't think that that's terribly. And again, I'm always, I was not born in the 1950s or, or I did not live through the 1950s and I'm not a model from Tennessee by any stretch in the imagination, but I had enough of an interest to learn about Betty Page that I mm. think I ended up writing about her more yeah. convincingly than Amy Sherman Palladino, right? It wrote writing about Jewish stand-up comics in New York and yeah, late I, mean, like, early I, I thought Mrs. Maisel was like a thoroughly enjoyable show. I don't think I would ever look at it and go, I bet that's how it really was. Right. <laughs> like it's it's meticulously researched. But again, it's like I think this the closer you are to a culture and a thing, the easier it is to go like I just can't watch this because yeah. it's so deeply fr like I get the fantasy element, but there's a there's a point at which there's a breaking point, at least for me, at which it stops feeling like fantasy and starts feeling like fraud. Right. It's it's like that thing where, um, you know, like as as a comic fan and a comic reader and a comic writer, I I don't like the Big Bang Theory, but I especially hate the stuff that is about comics because it's like. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you guys know yeah. about science, apparently, I guess. But like the comic stuff is like, eh, nerds, eh, aren't they wacky? Yeah. And like when you see a show like, like, God, I hate that I'm referencing this. There's an episode of One Tree Hill where they make like a reference to, I want to like, it's like, I think it's The Alcoholic, which is one of my favorite comic books. And I was like, I was like watching it being like, this is a garbage show about high school basketball. And it is doing like more deep cuts about comic books and like yeah. the nature of graphic novel marketing than Big Bang Theory, which purports to be the expert. Yeah. Well, no. And, and you know, Zach Levi was playing a nerd on Chuck and like he had a Tron poster on his wall. And I'm like, he's 20 years too young. And I'm talking about not a Tron legacy poster. Yeah. He had a Jeff Bridges, like no one his age is obsessed enough with Tron to own a poster of it that is on their wall. That is like the studio going, what poster can we get for free that we own the rights to? Yeah. Uh, and it's not nerd culture as it really is. It's, you know. This, this is a question of what you're selling. It's what you purport to be. I mean, uh, we, we started off talking about Fast and the Furious. Fast and the Furious doesn't claim to be anything but just just popcorn entertainment right you you buy into that you go in you have a blast or you don't you leave and and there are no feathers ruffled at the end of that but with something like mrs mazel that 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 sort of i mean i think it leads uh it you know claiming to be a cultural experience claiming to be a, a historical document um and yeah. so that's that sets cert certain expectations right I mean, um, like, and so you better get it right because there are people who are going to defend that in the end. There are people that go in uh, attached to to the history, to the culture, and and you you can really violate those people's trust very quickly. Sure, and like for you know, there's two things about Mrs. Maisel for me. Like one, it is a show that constantly reinforces the idea that if you are wildly talented, things will be difficult but always exciting, and eventually you will get everything you want. And that is that's what people have a me. horrible tendency to believe that yeah they were never lucky <laughs> yeah well, well, but like no 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 See, this is the difference is that like the show does really focus on the hard work of it and it's five seasons to get to the point where she has a slight break that gets her success so like for me that aspect of it is like yeah no if I if I work hard enough I'll have that too that's a I, I like that feeling I'm 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 a special trouble genius too like it's it's just it's yeah, but the you, audience to to go in to 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 address that, like the thing I was talking to my friend about is Elaine Boozler. You know, the series ends spoiler with her getting. Did, 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 did you want to pick up that name that you just dropped, or, or <laughs> yeah. Did, yeah, okay, cool. All right. I don't know that anybody I, uh, is impressed with that name drop in the 21st century. I wish they were. <laughs> I actually. would be if I didn't know that you knew her. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, the uh, I, she, her name is down there with Michael Bay's. So if you could just pick that up and hand it yeah, over to me, then uh, the, then we'll the, be good. The climax of the series is that she gets booked at the last minute on Carson, and is going to do. And he says, "Oh, you you can't you can't do stand up. Just come sit on the couch." And she disobeys him and goes stands over in the microphone and does a thing. Every aspect of that is oh, science fiction. And Elaine said to me, "I did Carson. I worked on my." material for a year i previewed everything i was going to say with them for six months i tightened that at, like literally you work on should i put the pause here or the pause there for a year before you actually go out and do carson 
Yeah. And any and again, like to me, it's you want to do fantasy, fine, whatever. But it's again, it's it's just that thing of like I always think honestly, the real thing is way more interesting than your dumb fantasy of it. Yeah, yeah which is that's, why that's, Hacks is a better show. Like I'm Hacks not, I'm is not. Great. and spe and, and yeah. speaking of Boozler, that was one of those things where that show came out and everybody said, Oh, it's Joan Rivers, and I went, Oh, it is not Joan Rivers. <laughs> Earth, man and gene smart over and over again says no i'm elaine boozler in the show what is wrong with you people i mean it's her that is not joan rivers comic persona at all that is elaine boozler's comic persona that i'm doing you know because joan did the thing and it was one of the things actually that drove me crazy about miss mazel and we will stop making this the miss mazel show for uh <laughs> but the thing if you were a really attractive woman doing stand-up comedy in that period you had to talk about what a dog and a hag you were and your husband wouldn't sleep with you. Like Joan Rivers is an objectively beautiful woman, but go back and listen to her act. It's all about, oh, ah, I'm a dog. I'm horrible. Everybody hates me. I don't look good. And even Miss Maisel would have been doing that material in that period. Mm. And Gene Smart's character is, I'm a sexy bitch and everybody wants me. And that's the 80s Boozler persona. That's the... You know, that's what she's playing on that show. Uh, and as someone who did, uh, uh, I met Elaine doing her uh, her video editing for years. And there's a scene in the third or fourth episode of that where Hannah Einbinder is sent down to a basement where there are shelves and shelves of three quarter inch tapes. And my wife literally looked at me and put a hand on my leg and went, I'm so sorry. Is this upsetting for you to look at? <laughs> and it's literally go down and digitize all these old three quarter inch tapes. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did this. I, I I did this. I am not a bisexual stand-up comic, hot young lady, but uh, I have I have had this exact experience somehow. You can be anything you want if you believe in yourself, David. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. what comics are all about. To but, bring yeah. it no, like, put, just, just put your mind to it. I'm sorry to bring it back to Mrs. Maisel, but I, I want to like circle into one. <laughs> Maisel Fest 2023. This this is the the part that like I watched the first few seasons. I thought it's fine. I like I I do find it enjoyable. I'm not going to oh yeah no, away like, from that. She um, writes very funny dialogue, and Rachel but, Brosnahan is like of course, the most yeah. charming creature on earth. But the um, the end of season three, uh, she essentially outs a uh, a gay black singer in the late nineteen fifties on stage to his Oof. like hometown crowd, and I'm like, wow, that's a pretty big fuck up to make. And then season four, episode one, is her being like, oh man, I got fired from his tour. How dare he? I'm right and should get to do whatever I want. And the empowering moment is her realizing that like as a very wealthy white woman, she should be able to do that. And that how dare anyone be mad at her. I was like, oh, you fucking lost me. Like, I am. Wow. I am well, and I'm going to say that up. that's because they hit upon it. They were fraudulent about a part of culture that mm. you understand. And that yeah, means a lot exactly. to you. Exactly. You now, know. by the way, my husband loves the show so much that I eventually had to go back and watch the rest of it. They do actually walk that back pretty effectively, and she learns a lesson and becomes a better person. But, like, still, Jesus yeah. fucking Christ. It's tough. No, I would have told you before that show dropped that I would have watched Rachel Brosnahan in attractive period clothes read the phone book. But apparently that wasn't true. I would have stayed tuned to the reading the phone book show probably a little bit longer. Uh, had they had they decided to make it, but all of this to say, what we're talking about are you know the reason we have gotten uh, tripped up on Miss Maisel for a half hour is that it's about authenticity, and uh, you know you can be glib about anything, and you can be absurdly anachronistic. Like you know the the world is full of comedies I've enjoyed that like have no bearing on reality whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm you know, and are full of anachronism and anachronistic attitudes. And that's kind of the joke and whatever, but the, it, when it feels fraudulent, that's when you check out yeah. when you go, that's fraud. And that's not, there's no honesty yeah. to the storytelling. It, it, it can be true in a human way without it being historically true, yeah. you know, to the letter. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. it could be it could be true in like a cultural way without being yeah. you know true to the historical. Some, um, someone once one of the great greatest things I've ever heard said about film acting, and it applies across the board, I think, to storytelling is the difference between real and true. Mm. And the example they used is uh, Jimmy Cagney. <clears throat> Jimmy Cagney never had a real moment 
on screen his entire career. But it was all true. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it, you didn't watch it and go, wow, people really behave like this. You watched, yeah, but in our souls, we are Jimmy yeah. Pack. Like, yeah. I understand this guy. I understand this this behavior, even though it is stylized. Mm. Uh, it's incredibly stylized, and people don't behave like that. And yet, it's compelling because there's a reality to it. Uh, you know, the, the the living metaphor of the human condition rather than just a guy on a reality TV show who is as real as possible and there's nothing true about him. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's the, that, that's the, that's the difference. And I think you true will, true should always outweigh real. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Real, I, 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 yeah. It. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why, I don't know why the, the walking dead uh, leaps to mind uh, right now, but or shambles to mind. Yeah. Well, there you go. But there were um, no, but 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 there were periods of the Walking Dead run where they were doing some very real, very I think important human drama, and it was some of the best human drama on TV. And I was really into it. I was really drawn in. I was really drawn to you know, um, I mean, some great actors in that in that show doing some great work for a while. Um, but then you could you would start to feel the writers. And and you could feel the writers trying to push you in a direction. You could feel the writers being like, "Oh, you think it's going to be over here? Let me rip you this way." You know that person that you really care about and that you have this, uh, um, you know, this emotional connection to. Let's kill him for no reason, just to mess with you, just to shock you, just to get written up in the papers. And and it goes from something that was very true and very moving to something that feels manipulative, and 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 you know, exploitational. And all of these things. And you can lose somebody in a minute. You can lose somebody with one wrong move. They, they had yeah. 10, 12, 13, 15 uh, uh, wrong moves in that show, um, at, you know, uh, at a certain point. But, I mean, I think that you have, to, you have to walk very carefully with this stuff. Especially when you draw people in. You know what I'm saying? When you've mm -hmm. earned people's trust and you are affecting people. Um, it, it's, it, it's like any relationship, right? I mean, uh, you know, writer to reader writer to viewer, whatever, it's like any relationship you can, um, nobody can hurt me like the people that are closest to me, like the people that that know me, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like the people that have me in the palm of their hand, right? And so as a writer, if you have drawn an audience in and you've earned their trust, man, you got to protect it, right? I mean, because because you can you can smash somebody. Yeah. It, it, if you make a wrong move right so so it, it, it's it's this kind of incredible thing that we're signing up for right i mean that's the ideal right is that we're walking a tightrope with this stuff yeah no and 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 again the and the best thing that you can do on the on the obverse is make them feel seen and make them feel understood and that's you know that's the thing that bonds people to a work of art or an artist forever you know the, the it's that idea you know and it can that can go wrong people can make a lot of bad people made loving star wars a personality and uh you know and it and it didn't go well for them uh when the every time the series tried to grow up a little bit they got very very mad uh and wanted to still be treated like a 12 year old and uh I, I'm I'm kind of okay with not being 12 years old anymore. And I'll even go the other way. It's like, and people also hated on Star Wars when George Lucas went, no, these are these are children's movies, and I'm gonna make more children's movies. I'm sorry that you're all 50 now. Yeah. Well, actually, that was 20 years ago. I'm sorry you're all 40 now. I'm sorry you're all in your late 30s now, but I, I made the first one for 12 year olds, and I'm gonna make the Phantom Menace for 12 year olds. Because mm -hmm. no 12 year olds love nothing so much as senatorial uh, debates. Uh, but, uh, but all that said, uh, it, it is that, it is that the, there is a responsibility when you have an audience in the palm of your hand, uh, of what are you going to do? What are you going to do with that? And how are you going to treat them? Well, and, it, 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 yeah. Them treated badly. yeah. And, and particularly if you are purporting to be a cultural experience, a historical document, all of these things, you know, again, if you're, if, if, if you're saying, Hey, this is popcorn entertainment, you know, have fun or don't, the yeah. stakes are very low. When you say like, "Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to present a culture. I'm going to present a time and a place," and 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 the stakes can get really high, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, well, I, and, in, in any case, they're high, but they can get extremely high, right? And, and when, there are yeah. there are things that like we've become so. I Miss Maisel is another example. I love Tony Shalhoub, but yeah. uh, 
I'm a 57 year old Jewish man and I have seen very few Jewish characters on television played by Jewish actors. Uh, and just one more was not exciting for me. Uh, as much as I love Tony Shalhoub, and he's great, and I don't look at Tony Shalhoub in that part and go, this is inauthentic. It's not. He's very good at it. He's a very good actor. But the other part of me that was, there was nobody. Really? There was not one Jewish actor alive who could play Papa Maisel. I find that unbelievable. Look, I he's find great in Ninja Turtles. Yeah. I heard uh, yeah, De Niro in, turned them who down, is I think, in the so. Ninja Turtles? I could be mis. I'm sure he plays Master Splinter in, in the Michael. I could be misremembering that in I'm the sure. Michael Bay. I think he, because yeah. he's also Japanese, as you know. <laughs> uh, he's ja he's he's like Peter Sellers. He's he's any yeah. anything you want him to be. Uh, <laughs> and again, like there's a part of me that understands actors and stand-up comics both do this thing of everybody should be able to do anything. It's free speech and it's art. And you know, in a time where there are jobs available for anyone, like a 500 years in the future, sure. Let the white dude play Othello. Fantastic. Who cares? But right now, no, mm. <laughs> right now, let's not do the guy in blackface ever again. Um, you know, let's not let Fred Armisen in blackface play Obama just because, uh, just because Lauren Michaels can't see clear to hire a skinny black guy to go with his fat black guy. Uh, you know, it, it's a, uh, let's not do that. Let's not let, I mean, Fred Armisen wore blackface on television less than eight years ago. <laughs> like that's, Jesus. that's yeah. wild. <laughs> you know, like that's, 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 that's tough you know, that's, that's wild. And it's not like, and you know, Cancel, don't cancel. I don't care. It. I mostly care about. Let's just not do that again. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. You know. Uh, and yeah, there's a utopian world where anyone gets to play anything, and we can get to that world just as soon as there's equity in hiring practices all across the board. And since we don't have that, I don't want to see Fred Armisen in blackface. <laughs> you know, that's. It's it's a it's as simple as that. I, I, I'm going to go this far. Yeah. Even when we do have that, I don't want to see Fred Armisen in blackface. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I don't want, I mean, I'll be honest. I don't want to see Fred Armisen. Uh, but, uh, but that's a, that's a, that's a whole other. <laughs> Shots story. fired. Shots fired. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard anything good. I have never heard anything good about him. Uh, but uh, all of that said, I did want to touch on something from the book that I think is worth talking about. Uh, this was also, this uh, four color heroes will be simultaneously published. Uh, and I apologize. I don't. The name of the Maori language is not Maori. It's, no, no, it's um, Te Reo, T E base R E O. Um, yeah. So, like, look, I was raised shockingly in a very uh, like suburban and largely white uh, part of New Zealand. So, like, what I'm going to say here is not universal to the New Zealand experience, but. There, like New Zealand is a a uh, a bilingual nation, or I think trilingual. I think sign language is an official mm -hmm. one, as well um, now or soon something. Um, but when I was growing up, like speaking Tereo was considered like no one, no one did that. Like you, you had to take a language in high school, and you took either Japanese or French, and like six or eight kids took took Tereo and uh, it was, uh, it was very like off on the sidelines and it felt like that was pretty similar to being uh, like queer of any stripe in, in high school in at, at around that time um, in terms of like, Oh, well that's, that's, that's where that group of kids are going to hang out. And I, I, I sort of thought like when I, when I decided to make the book set in New Zealand, I said to Barbara fan base, I said like, can we, can we do a second edition of it? Um, and like, it's, it's coming out digitally in both languages. Um, we don't have like the capacity to put out a print edition of it. That would sure. be for That's a small market in New Zealand. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was, that was really important to me. And I wanted to, um, it's, what's, what's strange is I've been gone from New Zealand now for eight years and I went back there uh, in March and everything is sort of like changed pretty drastically. And like, like I'm not saying everything's better now, but there's now like a lot more 
a lot more Maori like language is being spoken in television and on signage for places. And it's just, it's, it's, it's become normalized because it was like a largely dead language because it was illegal to speak it for a very long time. Um, and so it's sort of it, a, a little part of me feels like, Oh, I'm just doing the thing that everyone's doing now. This would be kind of standard. But when I made the decision to do it, it was because I, I'd, I'd left New Zealand at a time where that was, really not seen anywhere mm -hmm. that sounded like i was really congratulating myself on being a big hero and i didn't mean to do that <laughs> no 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 one i i i didn't get that sense at all i i think it's uh it's a smart thing to do. and it's it's definitely i did not know <clears throat> excuse me i had no idea to what degree it was uh the language is spoken still uh you know like what the i mean to say that uh new zealand is a bilingual like america is not bilingual and i don't know what percentage of the population in the united states speaks more than one language we're we're spectacularly bad at that uh here uh i remember i remember going to montreal as a kid and being kind of shocked that like the stop signs were in two language you know there's mm -hmm. a party who goes Surely a French person could understand stop and an, a, an English speaker could understand arrête. like if you just want to choose one. <laughs> like you, sure. could, and, and you, I, you could probably get away with it on the stop signs, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, there's something somewhat impressive about that in its way. Yeah. I mean, I want to say like, like New Zealand is a officially bilingual, like right. it is not a widely spoken second language. Yeah. And like, there are still going to be people. Uh, uh, when I was there, so the, the way that Toreo works uh, is there's the letters are uh, like they, they, it wasn't a written language when the country was colonized. So um, right. there's a lot of like little weird ticks because the, the sound fuck is in a lot of words. So it, they had to find a way to spell that differently. Um, <laughs> so W -H, e -H -U -C -O -W -H. there's there's no there's no F in their alphabet. There's just W H. Mm -hmm. um as a sing a sort of considered to be a single letter um but there's also uh almost every or maybe even every word ends with a vowel and mm -hmm. so i was in new zealand there is a glass door there are two glass doors to go in and out of this restaurant and one of them says in and the other one says out and when you are outside the one that says out is written backwards on the glass and so it reads as tuo and i saw Someone look at that door and go, Ugh, bloody Maori everywhere. What does that mean? 2 0. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard you turn the uh, the accent on before. That's that's pretty substantial. It's, it's, it's yeah. an unpleasant accent. Um, yeah, it's it's strange, but like the 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 comparison I think between the, like the change that I've seen in being gone for eight years um, is really similar to a change that I saw in like, especially in high school where this book is set largely of queer kids, that how quickly that change happened. It feels really similar to me. Um, and I remember getting very angry because there was a, a, a girl I knew in high school uh, who was lesbian and was like, treated terribly for it she was mm -hmm. bullied she was just like like everything you expect like every stereotypical awful thing was happening to her and after high school she got involved with um uh an organization called rainbow youth and became like pretty prominent as a spokesperson for young queer people and i read an interview with her about uh, six years after high school and they and they said like what you know what was your experience like and she said honestly it was so great um i think we really underestimate how tolerant people are everyone was so accepting of me in high school and i had a really wonderful time and i'm like you didn't i was there i saw this <laughs> and i understand there's like a a desire to like rewrite history to make it feel like hey it was okay you don't have to be afraid um like you, you hey hey kids you can come out in high school and that may be very true now and maybe by saying that it's always been that way makes that difference i don't know but like mm -hmm. to me reading it and i was like that's really fucking disingenuous yeah. and that's um tough. pretending that like it's it's that thing no, no no we've always done this good thing 
Like, no, 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 we've never had blackface. Like, yeah. there, you can't look back eight years and see Fred Armisen. Like, no, not at all. Like, it's, it's. <laughs> look, I'm not here to talk about the past, right? Yeah, it's, it's exactly <laughs> that. Yeah. And one of the things I really wanted to, like, like, when I was in high school, if there was a boy who acted gay, big air quotes, um, he would be, like, very unpopular, bullied a lot by the boys, probably have three or four girls who were friends with him. Uh, and then, like, gradually kind of get accepted over the course of several years when, like, the straight boys re realized he wasn't trying to fuck them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that has shifted really drastically. Um, I know my friends who have kids who are in high school now are, you know, they're like, oh, no, like, it's, it's, it's good now. It really is. So 2004 is two years after I was out of high school. And I knew that, like, in this story... These two boys are gay. They never even say it. Um, they kiss once. The story ends with them holding hands because this is not a story about them going, oh, my God, suddenly I realized this thing. It's a story about them gradually realizing this thing about themselves, not right. because, like, not because they have to figure it out, I guess, but because, like, when it's never even a possibility to you, it takes you a lot longer to put it together. Sure. But I've also written um, so Oscar is the is the uh, Maori boy from the religious background. Patrick is the white kid from like a very toxic masculine background. But he is written far more like the stereotypical gay kid from that time. Like yeah. he's you know skinny with green hair and and very flamboyant and like quick witted and sharp tongued and like all of all of those. He's he's overly dramatic uh, in many ways. Um, he is the kind of person who I would have been friends with in high school. Um, I was not that because I was a weird fat kid with long hair and a beard. Um, but I really wanted to make sure that the way he is treated by everyone around him is like different than it would have been when I was there, but not that different. They are mm -hmm. completely tolerant of him, but you know that if they, if he ever said he was gay, right. they would turn on him in an mm -hmm. instant. Right. They can totally accept him as their gay friend. They'll make fun of him as their gay friend. But as soon as he actually is officially that, he is absolutely out. Yeah, you know, it's it's made me think about I, you know, I was in high school in the early 1980s and uh you know, had a couple of handful of I would say it was a big school. I had a handful of close friends who were gay and not in any way I don't remember any effort being made for them to stay in the closet, but also it was just a thing you didn't talk about. Mm. And I'd be really curious if they had experiences with like in the worlds in which I saw them, uh, you know, backstage at the theater, you know, at chorus rehearsal, whatever, there was no, I, I never saw them picked on in any social situation. I never saw them picked on in class. But I wonder how much of that was just because it's easier for everyone if we all just pretend you're kooky. Mm. You know, mm. you're the weird kid as long as you don't come out and talk about my favorite expression in the world, homosexual acts. Uh, <laughs> it's my favorite it's like expression in the world because of uh, a ver an old joke about it when someone uses the, I can't mm. even remember the framing of the joke, but it's like homosexual acts. And the guy says, I can't tell. Are you talking about dick sucking? Because Peter Allen, that's a homosexual act. Like, you know, <laughs> you know like a homosexual, when you say homosexual act, I assume you're talking about Liza Minnelli. Like, I don't know what the, um, but anyway, the, uh, you know, I, I remember just sort of a, a benign, like, yeah, we all, we all know Evan's gay. We all know, uh, I'm just trying to write, we all know Steve Stern is gay. Like we don't need to, it doesn't need to be addressed. How many no, more people do you want to out on this podcast? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you want to do you want to pause for a second and make a list? And we can just... yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I, I could bring us all down by telling you I know what happened to Steve Stern over the years, and he's gone now, sadly. But uh, but you know the uh, but it was an interesting thing that like, and it's the same thing at college. Whenever. I, because I went to this hippie college, everyone always talks about how, oh, I mean, the kids are so conservative nowadays. And whenever I hear that, I say, that's funny. I was in barred 40 years ago, 35 years ago, and uh, all the gay kids were in the closet in the mm. 80s. Mm. So it may have been a hippie paradise for you because you were away from your Republican parents for the first time in your life. 
Um, but it was still a repressive atmosphere compared to the atmosphere it's in now. And when I went back in the 80s, like every other kid was in a same-sex relation, you know, walking around campus, I'm like, oh, all of the girls are holding hands. How nice for them. Um, that was not a thing uh, mm. when I was here. Uh, everyone was, you know, we were we were the freest, most liberal kids in the country, and we were, most of them were still in the closet. Yeah. And uh, and I that has, you know, when people say nothing has gotten better. Yeah, it's a terrible time right now. And trans kids are being targeted and LGBTQ are being targeted. But they're being targeted in some ways because you can act because they're actually visible mm. now in a way that in the Reagan era in America, they were invisible. They were dead body statistics from AIDS. Mm. They were not people. Yeah. Uh, you know, Reagan's press secretary laughed about AIDS at a at a press conference kind of famously. Yeah. And, you know, there's a you know, there are people, as someone once said, you know, uh, it's funny that, you know, now that we all have video, I think actually a great science fiction designer, Michael Okuda, I feel like said this on Twitter the other day. It's funny that now that we don't we all have video cameras, what we're seeing more of is gay bashing and black people getting killed by police. We're not seeing a lot more UFOs, though. <laughs> like strangely everyone having a video camera has not resulted in a giant uptick in ufo sighting there, there was one in vegas a couple okay. of weeks ago i don't know if yeah. you saw that one but yeah. well, yes no, but there, yeah. are, there are some in the, late, in the late 90s there was a famous one in mexico city that got like captured by four different cameras from different parts yeah. of the city which made it a fairly convincing thing but he's like but what everyone is recording is cops killing black people and gay bashing yeah, yeah. and you know uh women calling the police on a barbecue because black people are there like that's up a thousand percent. Yeah. Uh, now that we all have cameras, like <clears throat> weirdly racial intolerance, intolerance was the thing not being photographed, not alien visitors from yeah. other worlds. And not to get like on my usual high horse about these things, but like most of media is being made by or mainstream media is being made by people who live in places where these things are like, in terms of gay rights, better. Like, yeah, yeah. if yeah. you like, uh, so I, I, for for people at home who don't know this about me, I live uh, half my time in LA and half my time in a technically a city in Canada, but it has real small town energy. Uh, my husband will not hold my hand in public when we are in Canada because sure. it is a wildly yeah. conservative area that is like full of money, full of education, and still, like, he does not feel safe and comfortable with it. And, like, when we are here, like, he is, he, you know, we're not sucking each other off in the street or anything, but, like, we can we can <laughs> not have to Not even in West Hollywood? Listen, I was, I had friends visiting from, uh, this is my favorite Hollywood story recently. I had friends visiting from Australia. Um, we were at a bar. We were sitting outside. And both of them really wanted to smoke. And they were sitting there holding their cigarettes, looking around nervously. And I was like, what are you doing? They're like, we're not sure if we're allowed to smoke here or not. Like, will we get in trouble? Will we get kicked out of this bar? Is it against the rules? And I was like, look at the next table right now. And they look over and there's like a guy who has stumbled in, set up his kit on the next table and is just doing heroin casually in the middle of the day. <laughs> oh, God. But that's more socially acceptable, actually. Uh, they both I, have I, a, I, they both, they both yeah. have a weight loss component, very yeah. attractive to the, I, I, the Los yeah. Angeles uh, audience. I, I do think it's such a good uh, point, you know, Richard, and and it's um uh you know it's it's about where you're set up, where you grow up, mm. uh uh you know geographics, all of that stuff, and sometimes sometimes you don't have to move very far to see a radical change. Like yeah. I, I I I grew up in in Detroit proper that was where i went to high school and my world was about this big mm -hmm. you know you, you know D david you talk about th there were most certainly you know uh, uh homosexual students at, at at my school you know didn't get talked about Can because the names of them as well yeah yeah i'll uh in, i'll put it in the show notes so just just <laughs> check it out but um it, you know and 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 you know so it was kept very quiet and it was kept quiet because they knew that if they came out you know it would be a problem uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh all of that things you know you were you were basically either black or you were white and the white people hung out with the white people and the black people hung out with the black people and and there's just a lot of a lot mm -hmm. of tension most of it unsaid but 
you know, again, you, you, you flick some sparks at a powder keg and it can get ugly really quickly. But this is, um, this is the, the huge difference, right? Like people who are not oppressed by these things. And I'm telling yeah. I'm, you, know, I'm saying straight cis white people, essentially, yeah, yeah. like who are still the majority for in terms of power. Yeah. Um, they will look at them and go, can't you just be happy? Like, yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't have to you don't have to talk about being gay publicly. Can't yeah. you just be happy that we're not killing yeah. you anymore? Yeah, yeah. This isn't a problem for me. But yeah. but here's the th here's the thing. So I, I went to school at I went to college at the University of Michigan. It was it was forty five minutes up the freeway. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And 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 in my world, you know, it it it, it blew up like a thousand times. You know, mm -hmm. and 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 it it was literally a completely different universe there. I mm -hmm. mean, it was like you know, if you told me I I had been transported to a different planet. Uh, I wouldn't have been surprised just in terms of what was going on there socially and politically. And, and, you know, you, you, you live on a dorm your freshman year and I have a, a, a Muslim roommate and a roommate from Columbia and the guys across the, the, the hallway are from India, uh, uh, two different parts of India uh, that are very different socially and politically. And, and you learn very quickly, right. Yeah. Um, uh, your, your world blows up and in, in, in the best way. And, yeah. and I think, I think that if everybody could make that 45 minute trip up the road, uh, at some point in their, in their lives and they, they wouldn't have to experience it for very long. You know what I'm yeah, saying? And, like it, 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 you know, it'll, well, you know, go ahead. And some people need to be told that escape is possible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's probably the most white, most cis, most privileged take, but like, when I watched Boys Don't Cry, part of my reaction was like, why are you still in this state with these people? You got a car. Yeah. Yeah. Draw, you don't want to be killed? You want to fall in love with a girl who will accept you for what you are? Go to New York. Go to San Francisco. Like There are plenty of places that aren't as expensive as San Francisco or New York where you also won't be killed. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, it just... And I know that, that there's the privilege. I mean, part of me has uh, struggles with the idea of when your life is at stake, don't worry as much about, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a job or afford an apartment. Yeah, but David, you're you know? massively overlooking the like internalized self-hatred. Oh, I'm no, I, I mean, I, I totally, like, I get that. That's the part I find frustrating well, as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and places in your roots, they have this gravitational pull. You know, you, yeah. you go, you know, one of the more poignant things, you know, in The Wire uh, is is when, when Wallace dies. And he was out, you know, he was like upstate with his grandmother. All he had to do was stay up there, but 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 he didn't, yeah. he didn't know this place. You know, he was miserable there. He, well, he, knew and I, he knew Baltimore. It had this gravitational pull. He came back and, and that was the end of him. Well, yeah. and I, I but, you know, there, there are a lot of false dichotomies about, you know, what separates portions of the human race from one another but i really think the one unescapable one is the people who never move more than 25 miles from the hospital in which they were born and the people yeah. who do and yeah. the people who not only do but are com couldn't survive not doing that and yeah. i don't even mean not survive in a sense of like oh i won't be happy it's just like i i literally don't know what i would do with myself if i still lived in central new jersey um, you know, and part of it is because yes, there's a culture out here and there's a, there are jobs of it, but right now I'm a comic book writer. I can live wherever the hell I want. Mm -hmm. Uh, really, it wouldn't make any appreciable difference on what I do. Most of my meetings occur in a world like this one, uh, even the important ones, but I, I was in New Jersey for 22 years and I, I saw it, I did it. And I think there's a, there's this. I really think on some, you know, chromosomal level, there's the travelers and the non-travelers. There's yeah. the there's well, the people yeah. who need the familiar. And again, I'm not I'm not even knocking that. I wish I you know, sometimes I wish it was more satisfying. I I would have spent 8 years with my parents that I didn't spend. Well, yeah. I just yeah. I, I, as the parent of a 6-year-old, you know, she doesn't want to try anything new. She likes hot dogs and hamburgers and and, well, those uh, do rule. They do. They do rule, and I love hot dogs and hamburgers more than anything. However, you know, as uh, um, you know, as, as Sesame Street will tell you, as any you know good uh, uh, children's program will tell you, you got to try new things because they might mm. taste good, right? Yeah. And uh, and every time you try something new, your 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 world gets a little bit bigger. And I think that you know, um, yeah, I I think that when you grow up in a place, you know, that is so small, 
and 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 so sort of regimented and the world makes sense to you that you know the idea of looking out past the fence is terrifying yeah, you know and, in a lot of ways but but what i do think man is that all you have to do is is be out there once and it can fucking change you it can change you in a yeah. moment but yeah, it's like a, like, there's the third type which is the person who lives for a very long time in a in a place where they're never happy they want something more and then they go on one trip to one other place and go I'm happy here. This is where I will stay forever. And their world <laughs> stays exactly as small. It's just a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. Just, no, the, that, the variables are different. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, I think that, yeah, that is very closely related to the first type. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, there they, 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 yeah, they, are people that regress. I mean, my, you know, I, I have a lot of family that, that, you know, they started in Detroit. They moved to a, a town called Crossville in Tennessee, which is in the mountains halfway between Nashville and Knoxville. It is uh, statistically the least diverse county uh you know in in the country and and you know their world got a lot smaller in a, in a lot of ways and but, I, I i think that that's absolutely true but so but, much of this comes from like we are told what we should want we are told what a good happy life looks like all of the time yeah. and i think all three of us are very different in what we think our happy life looks like um and i think that but we are all we're all versions of a certain type of happy happy life. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I, I, my friend called me yesterday, kind of in a in a panic because like he cares more about his work than he has ever cared about any relationship. And he's like, "Am I am I broken? Am I like a sociopath?" I'm like, "No, you're fine. You just want different things." And I, I said to him, "Like you've just seen a lot of movies where people." work really hard and have great success, and then at the end of their life, they as they're dying alone, they say. I'm sad in this last moment because of this. I'm like, does it matter if you're sad in one moment of your life? Maybe like focus on the, all of those people are people who have incredibly happy, exciting lives all the way up to that last moment. Yes. It's just, it's just, we just get hung up on, we should want this thing. The characters in the story should, why well, they are being told they should want to be like the other boys. They are being told they should want to be, you know, really early on in the story, Patrick asks Oscar if he believes in like the religious stuff. Mm -hmm. And he just says that's complicated or that's a lot more complicated. And it's because he's, you know, he, he doesn't know if he believes in it, but he wants to, like he really, he wishes that he had that thing that the, the people around him have because he sees it making them happy. Right. Right. And that, you know, and that's a, that is another kind of choice. The, the, the choice to accept something, you know, the, that you accept something on the grounds that, you know, it will make you happy, even as you know, it's not really true. Yeah. Uh, you know, accepting an illusion that you, one of my favorite moments in any comic book, I think about it all the time. And I also think about the fact that it's in a superhero comic all the time, which are so often derided. Um, in terms of words to live by, there's a moment in Jim Starlin's The Death of Captain Marvel where he's dying of cancer, which was groundbreaking at the time. And he has a metaphorical fight in his head with Thanos to stay alive. And Thanos introduces him to death, who he, Thanos is in love with, who appears to him as a beautiful woman in a black cloak. And he says, you know, the time has come. She's here for you. Uh, are you scared or something like that? And he says, no, it's just that I no longer need the illusion. And he passes his hand over death's face and she turns into a skeleton and he goes off with her. And it's just that I no longer live the need the illusion is a line I think about at least once a, le a week mm -hmm. because I think it's a deeply profound thing. You know it's an illusion, but there are a lot of illusions that we find pleasant mm -hmm. and that make it possible for us to get through the day. And I think a lot maybe too much about like, what are those of mine and what cost would it be to let go of them? And in a lot of cases, I do feel like, no, I just no longer need the illusion is the way to go. Uh, so thank you for that, Jim Starlin, in your, in your obsession with the, uh, you know, with death and mythology. I, 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 I and, and where, what this is reminding me of also was I, I think that, you know, the, the smaller your world is, the the fewer things can go wrong, uh, the fewer things can get soiled, the easier it is to manage happiness. The mm -hmm. the, the metaphor that pops to mind is um, I started, you know, I, 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 I started getting, you know, halfway decent at golf when I was uh, in high school. 
and um, had, a, had a normal, regular, everyday swing. A normal, regular, everyday swing, there are about three or four things that can go wrong with it, right? And so if, if I'm having an off day, I can go back to, to one of those three or four things. I can make an adjustment. I can get back on track, right? Well, I start getting good. And my stepdad worked for the PGA uh, Tour as a, he was a chef at a at a, a, a club that they own. But he gets me lessons with a, a PGA Tour professional who gets me using my entire body, right, in a swing. And if it's on, I'm hitting the ball 20, 30 yards, you know, further than than I would have, and and, and I'm I'm dropping dimes. However, he has he he has so changed my swing that there are not now three or four things that can go wrong with it. There are 20 or 25 things that can now go wrong with my swing. And if I am having an off day, I cannot sort through it. I'm completely lost and I'm fucking miserable. <laughs> and so I think that if you, if you grow, if your world is small, if you live in a small town, if you subscribe to a, 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 a religion that says, Hey, here are the 10 rules that we subscribe to. Nothing else matters. The only people that matter are the people in this room or in this church or, 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 or whatever. Um, your life is a lot more manageable, right? Yeah. Uh, no, nothing outside of this little bubble matters. So I can manage the three or four things in this bubble and, you know, happiness, calm, ease is, is, is much easier to attain. I think once you open yourself up to, to the world, right? To every, you know, this is why Twitter is a problem because, because every bad thing that happens gets, uh, you know, gets, uh, um, you know, just um, uh, 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 announced to the world. You know what I'm saying? It's like when, we, we are opening ourselves to the horrors of everyone and we see everything that is wrong in the world. And, 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 and because we have empathy, we, we want to fix it. We want to help these people. It becomes very hard to, to stay happy, to stay calm, uh, uh, to stay at ease because, well, even if things are going right with us, well, it's, it's not right over there. There's injustice here and we have to fix it. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 um, and it's, of course it's important to open ourselves up to this stuff and to help when we can and how we can. Uh, it be, but it becomes very difficult to, to, to manage our own happiness in relation to that. Right. A lot of people have that. I think that's why so many of us are unhappy right now is because, um, because, you know, we could be perfectly happy in our home, but we get online and it's like, Oh shit. You know, the, this, this fucking submersible just blew up. Uh, there's a war going on in Ukraine and all these people are displaced. There's uh, uh, you know, this thing's going on in the trans community. Um, oh my God, the world sucks. Like, what the fuck am I doing? How can I be happy in this world? Um, and so, you know, again, I mean, I think that there is a, um, I mean, for a lot of people, and I, I know it's like this for people in my family where it's like, a, it's almost like a, a, a survival instinct. It's like, let me retreat into this little bubble where I can control everything. Um, and they say, hey, if you follow these 10 rules, then you'll be a good person. You'll get into heaven. Everything will be fine. You'll have no problems. Um, I, I can see how that's that's like a drug yeah. that that would be very enticing, right? I mean, I think like one, not, not to like keep trying to bring it back to the, the book of it all, but like- No, please do, yeah. One of the things that was really important for me and like the reason I, um, the book mostly focuses on the religious boy, Oscar. <laughs> Um, it tells things mostly from his perspective because uh, he's the one who's like really learning about the world. He's the one coming into a new environment, but also because I knew that if I had written the book from the perspective of Patrick, he would have been like, I'm a bad teenage kid. I've got some radical attitudes and religion sucks. And like, it's very easy to write a religion sucks story. What's yeah. really hard to do is write a, Religion sucks for the same reasons that a lot of other things suck. We just have like a, a, a tent pole to hang it on to say, mm -hmm. like, look at this bad thing. Look at this bad organization. Look at the bad ideals they these people have. And then if someone says that they're not that, most of the time, people who say they're not that still have some of those pretty shitty things in there as well. Um, so I wanted to like find find that balance, I think, because um, mm -hmm. we all we all ascribe to, to rules. We all we all have the, the comforts we look for. And I think rather than what you're talking about isn't necessarily terrible. If you wake up every morning yeah. determined to fix everything in the world, you'll become paralyzed. But yeah. No, and, and you know, I think the religion thing, you know, what you just said about that is is you know, I I self identify as an atheist. I certainly am not a follower of any organized religion. 
Uh, and I do believe, obviously, that organized religion has done an enormous amount of evil in this world. Mm -hmm. But I also, like, I know people who organize religion helps enormously. And if they need to believe X, Y, and Z to get to a place of happiness, and if they can do it without hurting people, and with, I don't, I don't care what they believe. It ultimately, I care how they act. I hear, I care how it affects their behavior. If every American Christian actually behaved in a way consistent with the beliefs of Christ, America would be a fucking paradise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, they, yeah, they yeah they that's what keeps popping in my mind. Yeah, is that Christ is, yeah, Christ is not the problem. His teachings were not the problem. It is, it is how how man has perverted them uh, almost every day since that that becomes the problem. That that yeah. it gets wielded like a sword. Uh, uh, it, it turns into if you don't believe these things that I believe, then there's something wrong with you, and I may have to kill you. I may have to go to war Some, with you. It's all these things that were done in His name, and not Him or the teachings or anything like that. Yeah, but Some, Sorry. Some devout Christian on Twitter the other day was talking, you know, one of their critics, one a people they don't, a person they don't like on Twitter revealed that they were uh, struggling with cancer. And this Christian was like, oh, well, that's Christ smiting my enemies for me. Awesome. I was like, holy shit, is that not how Christ does things, dude? Even if you believe <laughs> in that particular superhero, that is not one of his powers, is mm. giving cancer to people you don't like. That's not... That isn't the story. That's not the myth. That's not, who the hell told you that that was? I mean, it's an interesting, not to get off on the complete tangent of that, but uh, I remember after 9-11, there was a, I, I saw a group of religious philosophers talking about, you know, it's, you know, the <laughs> infantilization that like, Talking about like, well, why, you know, why are Muslims suddenly this global threat? And and he said, you know, the basically, and it was, a, I think, a Catholic priest saying you have the revolution in Christianity is a revolution in, uh, in literacy. He's like, when it's the priest tells you what's in the book, you have a very different religion from when it's you read the book yourself and form your own conclusions. And this was a Catholic priest, if I remember saying, speaking positively about the Protestant Reformation, basically saying, hey, it happened because you could actually read the book. It wasn't in some untranslatable alien language anymore. And you could go, hey, I don't agree with all of this. Mm. And, on, and also, I don't agree with how the Vatican is interpreting all of this. You know, there was a great roundtable with, uh, I think it was Sam might have been Sam B, about she got together a representative of every major world religion and said, okay, so the problem with abortion is a religious problem. Tell me where in your religion your prophet says abortion is bad. And every single one of them said, yeah, it's not in there. There's, there is no written down religious. I think the Buddhist might have actually said, well, no, actually, there, you know, since since we're not about stepping on ants, we, we do value the fetus as much as an ant. But the... Uh, but Judaism, Christianity, <clears throat> Islam, like, nope, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't come up. That is an interpretation and in, in most cases, a much later yeah. interpretation. It, it would be it, it would actually be a much more complicated question. Uh, yeah. Uh, and because, you know, yeah. yeah, I'm talking yeah. about, yeah. You know, the yeah, yeah. quote unquote, Western yeah. religions It is a far well, it, more complicated it, conversation. Yeah. 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 Uh, re Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, which is not famously an oppressive religion. Uh, but yeah. yeah, even the ones that we think of as oppressive dogmatic religions are like, nope, sorry. You know, she's like, sorry, there's nothing in there. Uh, yeah. You know, the Pope saying abortion is bad is very, very different from finding a place where Jesus did it because yeah. he didn't and it doesn't happen. And so, it, you know, as is so often the case, the people are the problem and the people are the solution. And as you, you know, what, you know, your book is about, you know, I, you know, I've talked about the, 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 the religious application of the superhero mythology, uh, a time or two and a place or two and, you know, replacing religious dogma with a set of mythological leaning stories about someone who always does good. It's kind of a one for one swap. <laughs> In some ways, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been wanting to write an essay for years about uh, fan iconography as religious iconography. Uh, it gets complicated every time I, I see someone who says they're a Star Trek fan and can't stand all of the diversity 
and how political modern Star Trek is, I'm like, what show were you watching, man? Because I, I don't know. I, I saw politics everywhere in that thing. But there's that thing when a Christian sees someone walking around with a, uh, a cross around their neck, they make assumptions mm -hmm. to a certain degree about what that person believes and what they stand for and what they think is important in this world. Uh, the Starfleet Chevron can have a similar effect on me. I see that on someone and I, know this, I think this is a person who believes in diversity and inclusion and justice and blah, 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 blah. Mm. It's the, now the difference between seeing someone with a Superman symbol on their chest and seeing someone with a Batman symbol on their chest or seeing someone with a uh, Captain America shield on their shirt mm. or seeing someone with a Punisher emblem mm. on their shirt. Like, <laughs> you have misidentified who the good guy is in that story. Uh, and uh, maybe you've misunder misunderstood what that, you know, there are plenty of people who think, no, uh, these are, uh, Chaikin says this a lot, and I don't necessarily agree with him, but that it's all fascist power uh, analogies. And it's like, yes and no, depending on, you know, anytime you throw like all superhero stories are this into a mix, you're saying, so... Bill Willingham and Jack Kirby and Jim Starlin are all the same guy with the same political view telling <laughs> the same story. I don't, I don't think that's true at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we we, we ascribe to our gods what we want them to stand for. for yeah, us. no, ex ex exactly. And I think that it's, you know, if there's a thing that comic book culture and superhero culture does not profit from, it's generalizations about the entire field. Uh, because it's a very even when someone says, "Well, Superman is this, Spider Man is this," it's like, according to who? Siegel and Schuster's Spider Man, uh, Superman, is this fantastic left wing FDR New Year New Deal Democrat? Mm -hmm. uh, that ain't John Burns, nineteen eighties yeah. Superman by any stretch of the goddamn imagination. And uh, Zack Snyder's Randian, you know, uh, Howard Rourke meets. Uh, John Galt Superman is a, is a completely unappealing uh, figure to me. But it, it so, comes down to like how important the symbol is to you. You know, like yeah. there is a difference between someone wearing a cross around their neck that is something between a piece of jewelry and a statement about their faith versus someone who has a fucking cross tattooed across their entire back because it is their identity. Yeah. Well, and you know, my favorite tattoo story is the guy who had the, the guy who had the 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 verse from Leviticus that uh, bans homosexuality mm -hmm. in a fairly abstract way, actually, tattooed on his arm. And everyone pointed out to him that just two verses over is the one about tattoos. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> like, yeah. like Leviticus comes down harder on tattooing than it does. The one on homosexuality is mostly don't abuse the altar boys in temple. That's mm -hmm. it's 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 fairly specifically, uh, it it's it's placed in an interesting context that is not, uh, two dudes who hang out or in in love shouldn't touch each other in a, a fun way. It's very much don't abuse people you have power over, uh, again in its framing. But the tattoo one is not big. <laughs> <laughs> the tattoo one is very like it's an abomination. You can't get buried in a Jewish cemetery if you have tattoos. So it's, it's why I had to get my uh, Thug Life tattoo uh, lasered off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really sorry you had to go through that, Rylan. That's yeah, it's cool. unfortunate. It's very traumatic. All, it's all hard for me to, to talk about. All to be buried in a Kryptonian cemetery. There you go. I, I, was, I was at 7 uh, Eleven recently, not to brag. And um, <laughs> there was there were the life. two <laughs> symbols that I thoroughly enjoyed seeing. One was a bumper sticker on a car out the front that was the Punisher logo with Mickey Mouse ears, but with the Blue Lives Matter American flag on it. The other was on a person's uh, backpack inside the store that was also the Punisher logo, but this time as the trans flag. And I was mm -hmm. like, I don't know who's more confused about what they're doing <laughs> out of those yeah. two people. Yeah. Yeah, you just want to say like, I have about 300 comics for you to read where the Punisher kills a lot of cops. I, <laughs> you know, not, not, yeah. that, not, not for nothing, but uh, Jerry Conway thinks you're an asshole. Uh, just, just, just for the right. The guy who created the Punisher 
has spoken often about how fucking horrible this is uh, and how he feels a little bit like the creator of Pepe the Frog in yeah. how grievously something he created has been complete. And again, it's the, you know, one of the most memeable moments from a, uh, a, a sketch comedy show ever, the Are We the Baddies moment, which is... You know, something anyone who studies history wonders about. I and mean, if you're not familiar with it, there's a British uh, sketch show. I can't even remember which one it was, um, where there are two Nazi officers standing on the front, in SS uniform, standing on the front lines. And one of them goes, you know, I was looking at our hats the other day. And uh, we've got these two skulls. Are, are we the baddies? You know, like, the idea, like, our iconography seems terribly death and murder oriented if we're the good guys that seems very wrong you know and when, and when you hear about you know units of the united states military or police forces using this like death's head uh iconography it's like are, are we are we the baddies like have we that's not what the good guy the good guy does not have the skull on his outfit pretty, doing, pretty sure. doing it wrong it's the adherence to the rules that I think is, is the problem. Like when you give, when, whether it's religion or star Wars fandom or any other thing, mm -hmm. when you, when you establish that you care about something very deeply and then you decide what the rules of that thing are, because everyone's interpretation is going to be different. And mm -hmm. then you become locked into those rules. It's just as unwelcoming as an environment for everyone else, no matter what the thing is, you know, it's the, um, I, I know that I, I complain about this too much, but like I feel very unwelcome in, in, in a religious setting because like I'm not adhering to the rules of that religion. And right. whether people are from a, a church that preaches that there is no hate and God believes in love and what have you, there's still going to be 30 other rules that I'm not going to enjoy. Right. Um, but that is exactly the same as if uh, why I don't want to go to a gay bar and wear the whatever current fashion is for that, like for my particular subset of queer culture, because yeah. again, as soon like it's that we set up things that as soon as someone does something that is different than what we have told ourselves, we believe in or care about, we have to cast that person out. And that's yeah. like, like every society becomes unwelcoming at some point. Oh, yeah. Look, you know, when I was at Bard, I wore a jacket and a tie partially because I was surrounded by hippies. Mm. And there's no way the only way to be unorthodox. Or, now, <laughs> I was politically aligned with those hippies about 98 mm. percent. I hated Ronald Reagan possibly more than they did. Uh, you know, I picked I, I picked a girl up for a date once and her, her roommate. And this is in Los Angeles in the 90s. And her roommate came to the door and said, you're in a suit. And I said, yeah. And she's like, so are you like a corporate guy? And I said, William Burroughs wore a suit and tie. <laughs> like the world's most famous homosexual drug addict, you know, founder of the beat movement. Like it's, it's just clothes, man. It's not, mm -hmm. if you think it's the uniform your dad wore to the office, that's your, that's your issues with your dad. That has not one fucking thing to do with me. Uh, you know, most great liberals in American political life have worn a jacket and a tie at, at some time when they felt like looking like an adult. It's not, you know, I'm not going to judge you for the sandals and the jumpsuit. Why are you jumping? You know, why are you judging me? I went to a, a party in San Francisco once and a woman wearing jean overalls, a tie dye T-shirt and Birkenstocks saw me in a black suit and went, "Ugh, you're so L.A. And I said, of the two of us, one of us is a much bigger cliche of our urban environment and it ain't me. And I said, P.S. I bought this suit in New Jersey. I am dressed like an Italian from New Jersey. I am not dressed in any way. Like spend some time in Los Angeles. They're not wearing suits down there. Um, they're wearing shorts out to dinner. Uh, that is a that is a very different culture you're thinking of. But yeah, everybody, the reduction of people to their semiotics, to their, mm -hmm. you know, it's always bad. It's bad when a hippie says, why are you wearing a suit and tie? And it's bad when someone in a suit and tie says, why are you wearing Birkenstocks? Yeah. Both are bad. Both are the same intolerance wearing a different cloak. One has and more what, power, but... Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. You're right. It is the same feeling of being unwelcome. You know, when I, when I first moved to the U.S., when I first started coming out here, 
it was when Obama was president and things were pretty fun. And then when I moved here, Trump was president and things were less fun. <laughs> and part of it was not like, I mean, honestly, there are some things that Trump did that affected my life in very direct ways during COVID. But yeah. like for those first three years, he didn't really affect my day to day very much. But the feeling of like being at your friend's house and knowing that their dad hates you mm -hmm. is, is th that affects you. It, 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 it does something to your psyche uh, and it feels constant. And we constantly put ourselves in positions where we, adhere to rules and let them and like use them to make other people uncomfortable and mm -hmm. it's it's not the worst thing in the world like it absolutely isn't but it certainly contributes to that general sense of isolation well and and you know on that topic going back to bart in the 80s i remember uh someone asked uh the college president leon botstein he's a fairly uh, pretty astute guy uh you know do you feel like you know, Ronald Reagan has, you know, made the world worse way, you know, uh, and he said something about Reagan that I've never forgotten. And, and Trump is the same way. And Bush was the same way. Uh, the, the junior much more than the senior. It's not that they increase the amount of racists in the world. It's that they make the races go, oh, it's OK. Mm -hmm. It's OK for me to express this now. He's like, the amount of terrible people in America do not increase one iota under Ronald Reagan. What Ronald Reagan does is he tells the terrible people it's okay to be terrible in public. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I will I will make it okay for you. That thing, that horrible thing you harbor in your heart, that hatred you have for your neighbor who is gay, who is black, who is Mexican, any of that, now now you can say it. Because the mm -hmm. president says it. And the president clearly believes it. And you know, Reagan was a little more was a lot more dog whistle than Trump. Uh, <laughs> but he wasn't a lot more like, you know, but yeah. it was there, you know, he still announced his candidacy in 1980 in the town where the freedom riders were murdered, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to tell the Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. you kids are okay. In my book, mm -hmm. keep, keep murdering people, guys. I'm on. There, there are good people on both sides. I mean, yeah, right. It's, exactly. Yeah. exactly. That's, that is the, that is the recent version of that. And that's yeah. the. There was, there's a Twitter explosion today because uh, Moms for Liberty, which is this incredibly racist group, God, it's, put it's their an Yeah, but they literally put out a newsletter this week where they quoted Adolf Hitler. And it wasn't like they didn't know where the quote on the yep. front page of their newsletter. It's yeah. the quote, whoever controls the children controls the future, Adolf Hitler. Yeah, yeah. Without context... But it's like, you know, and they and they just put out a statement saying, well, obviously Hitler is bad and we should have condemned. It's like, no, no, no. But you're still quoting his philosophy. Yeah. Like, you're not getting why people are mad. <laughs> it, it's not that you quoted Hitler. It's that you think his philosophy is valid enough to quote, you know, I, um, not not to not to give them any kind of excuse, because, like, obviously um, they are fucking terrible. Um, when I was. When I was promoting, I did a, a feminist children's book. Um, it was a retelling of Pierre and the Lion, where it's about a girl who's so well behaved that a lion eats her and she has to fight her way out. <laughs> and uh, there was going to be a lot of publicity for it and things went sort of wrong. And I hired someone to do, uh, to like run the Instagram account for it. And I was like, and she, she came to me with this pitch where she said, I'm going to find like a bunch of quotes from like powerful women in history and like that, that are relevant to the story and like post them every day uh, like uh, with this with images from the book I'm like great that sounds like a great approach day one margaret thatcher <laughs> like what are you doing she's like i was like i, I call her and she, and she had no idea who margaret thatcher was she was like i looked up powerful women <laughs> she's very um, powerful yeah. yeah, I mean, no argument there. She was extremely powerful. <laughs> I did fire an, that publicist. An extremely powerful supervillain. And again, like, a, a, the, the, you know, the joke of a publicist. Mm. A publicist. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, yeah, speaking of William Burroughs, uh, the Lee side of his family, I don't know if they were related to the, the, the Robert E. Lees, but they were related to a person that Adolf Hitler hired to do PR for him in the, in the United States in the 30s. 
Jesus. Uh, eventually, they went, you know what? We're going to drop this account. Uh, but, uh, you know. It is so weird to think that the uh, the complex nature of public relations goes back that far. Like, like I think the most mind blowing thing about that is that Hitler had to hire a PR firm. Yeah, yeah. that Hitler went. I'm too unpopular in the United States. I need a PR. But look, it's all. Yeah. No, I mean I, it makes you know, sense when you when you scratch the surface. I just to, had never to, considered to be. That. You know, to not to be overly reductive of over <laughs> two thousand years of history, but Paul is just Jesus's PR person like it's you know it's all jesus becomes the son of god and i say this with all due respect for my christian brethren there were coins in the roman empire at the time that said that caesar augustus was the son of god you don't fight the son of god without another son of god yeah just simple i mean i hate to again i hate to reduce it but you're trying to bring down the roman empire and how badly did that fail 300 years later, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire, yeah. which is the Macy's selling tie day t shirts of its day. <laughs> you know, like we started this rebellion against this thing, and then this thing went, oh, Christianity? Sure, we can build our empire on that. Wait, no, that wasn't, hold on. <laughs> that we were, we were trying to do the opposite thing. And this all the empire comes always down wins. to the yeah. same thing I was saying before about. It's about the people's willingness to adhere to rules. Yes. This is like the yes, Macy selling tie dye t shirts. Uh, people like independent creators putting out stuff that is in line with what mainstream creators are doing. Uh-huh. Things that are like towing the line of whatever the the very safe version of pushing for rights and equality is. Like like these. Th- this is the problem. This is the insidious nature of it. I, I, I keep using the joke like to, to to appropriate a thing that I heard a lot in high school. It's only gay if you push back. I'm gonna use that as a fucking cry for a fight. You know, mm-hmm. this is this is this is my new stance. Like it is it is time for everyone to start pushing back. And yeah. if you if you don't, you're out of the club because these are my special rules now. <laughs> Sign me up. Well, rules being rules, we we are. This is one of our longest episodes ever because we love talking to you. Well, uh, it's my shift time. I had to go long, right? Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Uh, but we're so glad to have you on. I want to pimp the book again, Four Color Heroes. And also, we didn't talk about it at all, but this is an extraordinary book. Oh, thank you. Yes, that is Octopus. That is Octopus. No title. You have to see the spine. Um, the, uh, the regular version of that is green with a dog on the cover. Um, okay. The, you you got the fancy one because you're. I fancy got the boy. fancy one because I'm fancy like that. Um, um, and and uh, my new uh, haunted hill had the campaign will have ended yesterday when this comes out. That's my other new title. And then next month is the launch of the X Wives of Frankenstein. I knew uh, which looks fantastic. I saw the first chapter, and uh, and you liked my one note, so that was good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had one note. Um, the well, uh, uh, when this, by the way, the day this drops, I will be drawing the page where I have, uh, assuming that I don't fall behind, I'll be drawing the page of issue two that is specifically inspired by a conversation you and I had about a thing that is in your Frankenstein story that drops next week. <laughs> Funny, I, I will have to connect that dot. Um, nice. uh, when does Four Color Heroes drop? When is that available to people? Um, it's available for pre order now, fourcolorheroes.com. Um, despite being said in New Zealand, color is spelled the correct and proper way without a U in it, uh, because it is about American superhero comics, mm-hmm. um, and a term that relates to American superhero comic printing. Right. Um, fourcolorheroes.com or fanbasepress.com, and you can find the page there to buy it. Uh, officially, I think it's out July 26th. We'll have it at Comic-Con, and... Right. Um, you know, I'll be I'll be around and appearing places and signing things, and it's a real heavy book. Everyone should get it. It's, it's a heavy book, right? Like, oh um, no, it's I mean, just heavy. physically heavy. You know, I mean, physically heavy. It's, like, it's, it's not that heavy. I mean, it's it is it's it's substantial, it's a but tome. it is it's it is substantial in every look. It's no, you know, it's not some thirty issue, uh, you know, collection. It's a comic book collection. It's, yeah. Right? It's, it's not an omnibus, as it were. It's not it's not a wor- murder weapon. It's not one of those Scott Dunbeer uh, IDW editions you can put leg- legs on and make a coffee table out of. I've considered I if I didn't have a good coffee table, I think my Jim Starango artist edition 
<laughs> four legs and that thing is a gorgeous coffee table uh perfect for your living room you could just um, like seal it in lucite or something yeah yeah exactly maybe my friends at cgc will will do that we'll make a coffee table out of my uh, <laughs> my art my 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 artist editions um how embarrassing is it when you go to someone's house and their coffee table is like a 4.9 <laughs> all those rings man they bring the they just bring go. the price down uh, where can people find you on the net aside from uh, those two websites you just mentioned? Uh, kickrichard.com for all of my crowdfunding stuff. Uh, richardfairgray.com. I'm the only Richard Fairgray in the world, so if you look me up, it's me. Helpful. Yeah. If anyone else wants to have that name, I will fight them. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And Ryland, where can the kids find you? Uh, I'm also the only Ryland Grant in the world, so uh, coincidence um or ironic as a nitwit might say um i i am just I, I am just very happy that we finally know how and why hitler became times man of the year never underestimate the power <laughs> and ability of a great pr person william uh, Bur william burrow's maternal grandmother or grandfather i think yeah well, uh, I, the, the year that they had the reflective cover you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the foil edition I am uh, eight point seven. There you go. I <laughs> oh man, uh, I'm running out of pubes. I am at Ryland Grant on all forms of social media. That is R Y L E N D G R A N T. If you are just listening, and most of you are just listening, uh, I always spell it because it's not a real name. My parents just kind of drunkenly uh, made it up and arranged letters and saddled me with it, and so now I have to spell it for everybody. Um, yeah, if you, um, if you missed out on the jump three, uh, uh, Kickstarter campaign, you can hit my backer kit site, which is, uh, the jump three dot backer And, uh, that has everything jump, but also is kind of a one-stop Ryan and Grant shop. You can get everything, uh, you know, Banjax and Aberrant and suicide jockeys and peacekeepers and all that good noise. Um, plenty of good, amazing stuff coming out via Immortal Studios uh, very soon. Um, I think uh, Dynamite has November releases slotted. Okay. Um, you'll start hearing more and more about that stuff. Uh, big panel at Comic-Con, uh, Immortal Table at Comic-Con. and um, So yeah, I'm excited for that stuff um, with all my movie stuff, uh, you know, paused at the moment. Um, sure. But yeah. More to come on that stuff. So uh, uh, take us home, Avaloni. I'm, uh, I'm tripping here. I am not the only David Avaloni in the world, but the second one only shows up on page 10 or 11 of Google. Uh, he's a lawyer who is was a second lieutenant in the United States Army. Seems like a very nice guy. Good doesn't guy. write any doesn't write any comic books. Um, <laughs> thank you for your service. Yeah, thank you, Lieutenant uh, David Avaloni uh, Esquire, uh, for all of the things that you do in this world that aren't uh, writing. Uh, and I'm glad you don't complicate my life by writing comic books. That would be that would be painful for me. Um, uh, so yeah, davidavalonifreelance.com is the direct link to the um, to the website. Go today and to your local comic book shop and pick up Elvira in Monsterland number two. There will be. Uh, I'm working on a secret long form Elvira OGN that God knows when it'll be out, but. You'll be happy to know that the last page I saw completed was page 69. Nice. Uh, and uh, I mean, nice. And uh, that's about it for this exciting episode. Thank you for sticking with us this whole, uh, for, for Maisel Fest 2023. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think we should go six and a half more minutes and just make it a, a full two hours. But we we are gonna, <laughs> we're going to do like a watch party of all five seasons. Right? Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. going to. We're going to marathon. Uh, we're going to do our, our own. Discord. <laughs> we're, we're starting a new podcast where we break down every episode of Ms. Maisel, Maisel uh, with the three of us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and for sticking around uh, all the way to the bitter end. And we'll see you on the next exciting episode. Thanks, guys. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or other fine purveyors of ear crack, please leave us a five-star review. And wherever you're watching and or listening, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We'll see you back here next week for more madcap hijinks on The Writer's Block.